Let's say you uh, increase the concentration of ammonia. Okay. Will that cause K to go up or down? Trick question. K would be constant. Because K is not based on the actual concentration of ammonia. It's based on what the concentration would be at equilibrium, which we're not changing. Um, what would so be that essentially means that when you add more NH3, you're no longer at equilibrium anymore. And that's why it doesn't apply, right? Or um, because it's, it's probably just safer to say um, K has nothing to do with the actual concentration of the ammonia. So there's no reason for there to be an effect. Now, if you do increase ammonia, what will that do to Q? We get more products, and the products are in the numerator. Okay. So Q would go up. So it does have an effect, but it has the effect on Q, not on K, because it's Q that's based on the actual concentrations. Maybe we should mention, is there anything that could change K? Well, K does depend on temperature. There's different Ks for different temperatures. You might have sometimes noticed when you're doing chemistry problems, they might say, what is the answer at, say, 25 degrees Celsius? Well, one reason they have to specify that is there's different Ks at different temperatures. Oh, that reminds me what we were talking about before. We were talking about the uh, standard delta G. So we were talking about standard conditions and STP. And we were saying that even though they both have the name standard in them, they actually refer to different things, unfortunately. They both refer to a pressure of one atmosphere. But STP refers to 273 degrees Kelvin. Do you know what degrees this is Celsius? Yeah, that would be zero degrees Celsius. That's right. Standard conditions refers to room temperature which is around 25 degrees Celsius, which is 298 Kelvin. STP is usually used for, um, say, gas problems. And standard conditions is used for, um, well, this is used for, say, ideal gas problems. We're using the ideal gas law. Standard conditions is used when uh, more, well, sometimes used for gases, too, when you're focusing Standard condition is used usually when we're focusing on Q and K and the equilibrium. Um, one thing to notice is um, it makes sense that these are called standard conditions because a standard experiment would be done at room temperature. So it's, it makes sense that this would be standard conditions. <coughs> uh, but when you're working with gases, there's not that much difference between room temperature and 273 Kelvin because uh, gases aren't going to freeze just because this is the freezing temperature of water. OK. Um, so anyway, when we see delta G circle, we know that refers to um, gases that are at a partial pressure of one atmosphere. Um, and usually it refers to 298 Kelvin. Although sometimes people talk about standard delta Gs at other temperatures. But usually they mean this temperature. So this is what we mean by standard conditions. So when you, when you look up K in a table, that K is usually described to define for standard conditions, room temperature, because that's what you would actually be measuring in the lab, because the lab would usually be at room temperature. But if you change the temperature, that can change K. So K is constant with respect to the concentrations, but not with respect to temperature. Changing the temperature can't change K. So let's say that we start at equilibrium. Now we add more ammonia. If we add more ammonia, is that going to increase or decrease K? No effect. What's the effect is it going to have on Q? Increase. Adding more product means that now, in a sense, we're further forward. So Q is increased. 
what row would we now be in for our chart? The first row. So Q has gotten oh. bigger. If we're at equilibrium and then we increase the product, then we go reverse. So which row would we be in? The last one. Yeah. And I would I want to especially focus on how you can see that in terms of Q, though. Remember that Q used to be equal to K. Oh, And now what's happened to Q? It's increased. And what's happened to K? Same. Same. All right, so now Q must be bigger than K. So after step two, we would now be in this row. Again, we're using the fact that changing the concentrations changes Q, but it doesn't change K. So um, we've now moved away from our proper destination. We've moved down to here, out of equilibrium. Okay. All right, um, and now over time, what's going to be happening to Q? It's going to be uh, approaching K. Increasing or decreasing? Decreasing. Decreasing. Which way will the net reaction be moving? That's the whole point of this row, right? This is when the forward reaction is non-spontaneous, or we should say the reverse reaction is spontaneous. So as soon as we know when we're in this row, we know that we're going to start moving in reverse. So now the net reaction removes in reverse. And as that happens, what's going to be happening to Q? It's going to be uh, approaching K. By increasing or decreasing? By, By decreasing. Yeah, that's right. Because when we're moving in reverse, Q is decreasing. Until eventually, as you said, we'll be back to equilibrium. This is why this is called equilibrium. You don't always have to be in equilibrium, but if you are disturbed from equilibrium, the natural tendency is to move back to equilibrium. That's kind of the definition of equilibrium. It's the place that you always try to get back to, you, get back to if conditions are disturbed. Okay, so what have we decided here? When we add more product, does that shift reaction make reactions shift into forward or reverse? Reverse. Yeah, reverse. Now, what we're really doing here is we're illustrating Le Chatelet's principle, which is a very important topic on the test. They'll definitely be uh, tested. Le Chatelet's principle says that when you disturb an equilibrium, well, nature's, uh, Le Chatelet's principle says that if you start an equilibrium, nature will try to undo any disturbance that you impose on the system. That's kind of a, uh, a rough way of describing the Chatelet's principle. If you start at equilibrium, nature will try to undo any disturbance that you impose on the system. For example, if we add more products, is nature going to try to add or remove products? to undo what we just did. We just proved how that works. We added products, and then nature tried to undo that by moving up things in reverse. Nature tries to undo the disturbance. Now, usually when people learn the Chatelet's principle, they just learn what I just said. Nature tries to undo any disturbance, but we just proved the Chatelet's principle using Q and K. Well, we don't usually do proofs. Um, there's no proofs on the test, but this is such a simple proof that it's worth going through because it means that we really understand what's going on here. If you really understand Q and K, you don't need to learn about the Chatelet's principle separately. It's just obvious from Q and K. If you start an equilibrium and then you increase Q, nature will try to decrease Q um, to get you back to where you started. All right, so you don't have to think it through it in terms of this table every single time, but it's good to know that the table explains why when we impose a disturbance, nature tries to undo that disturbance to get us back to the equilibrium. 